Before we begin, I would like to emphasize that this podcast is separate from my teachings and work at Del Seton Medical Center. Any discussions we have on this podcast is for entertainment purposes only and in no way connected to Del Seton Medical Center. Hello, everybody. Uh, this is another episode of the Life of Flow podcast. No introduction is needed. Dr. Frank Thief is here with us today having a discussion about his recently published book, The Medical Jungle. We'll also talk about, yeah, phenomenal. You got to talk, you got to read it. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about what this 50th anniversary beef means for him and in between a lot of other very interesting topics, including covert operations and CIA. <laughs> Stay tuned. This is a great program. Thank you very much. Two vascular surgeons walk into a barn, come out with a podcast. We are talking everything vascular and not. Welcome to the Life of Flow podcast. Hello, everybody. It is a pleasure to have you here for another episode of Life of Flow podcast. I'm here with my co-host, Dr. Lucas Ferrer. Hello. And Miguel Montero Baker is here also. And I would love uh, to, <laughs> just incredibly excited to introduce our guest today, Needs very little introduction or probably no introduction. This is Dr. Frank Veith. And uh, Dr. Veith, without further ado, thank you for being on the Life of Flow podcast. It is an immense honor and pleasure to have you here. Well, it's a pleasure for me too. Dr. Veith, one of the things that we wanted to get right into was your book. You just uh, recently, I think in the last couple of years, came out with The Medical Jungle. And both Lucas and I enjoyed reading this book and maybe start off the top with what what was the inspiration at, at what point did you decide to write this book and how many years have you been putting into it i guess there are a couple of reasons i wanted to write it uh and and the actual project took me about two or three years uh but the the main reason i wanted to write it was to show people in addition to describing some of the frustrations and challenges that i had along the way to show people that even in medicine, uh, you'd like to think that human nature and some of its malign qualities didn't spill over into medicine, which is supposed to be an altruistic, uh, do good for people in the world, uh, specialty uh, or occupation, uh, to show young people going into that, 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 uh, optimistic outlook on medicine wasn't always the case that some of the more malign characteristics of human beings spilled over into medicine and in many ways slowed one's progress and proved an obstacle to things going the way you might hope that they would. Uh, those qualities, the malign qualities being the lust for power of the uh, sort of toxic self-interest that people have of greed and jealousy. And uh, much to my surprise, as my career went along, those toxic qualities of human beings often stood in the way of, of accomplishing stuff that one might like to accomplish. Do you think that that has improved uh, at all? Has it changed? You know, I think that the figure of like the strong authoritative leader in kind of surgery, the surgical space may be going away, especially in some, some institutions. Um, does with that, do those qualities or do those challenges lessen or do you think they just take a different form? I, I, I think Things are just as bad, maybe even worse now than they used to be because we've got all these silly, woke characteristics and, and tendencies of institutions that we have to deal with. You, you talk about surgical leaders. I, I think some of the problems acquire or, or spill over not only to surgical leaders, but to administrators, deans, hospital presidents. Uh, of course, chairman of surgery and others. And and I think for young people, particularly going into a 
academic career, one has to be aware that these obstacles are out there. They they often can be overcome by persistence and and other good qualities that some of us have, uh, but sometimes they can't be overcome, and sometimes they lead to inappropriate outcomes. Was this a was this a peri pandemic uh, project of yours? I guess part of it was it. It really was an idea I'd had for a long time about writing a book, uh, and uh, I had to. I got some help from a ghostwriter who actually did a lot of the work on the writing, although I had to edit it and so forth. I learned a lot of things, of course, of you that I didn't know. Um, you and I share the fact that we are only children. How uh, how much today do you feel that not having brothers and sisters throughout your life you shaped and do you feel uh, that you missed having brothers and sisters? Yeah, I, I do. I had friends that were almost like brothers uh, when I was a kid. And and being an only child, I think I, I was closer to my parents than, than uh, others might be. So I, that, that all... I think was they're like everything in life. They're pros and cons. Uh, you know, you you pay a price for being an only child, but you get certain advantages. Throughout the book, the I think a, a overarching topic uh, tends to be the space in which you develop, like New York City. Uh, and it's interesting to me as someone that has moved around a lot and and kind of ex, you know through training through. Uh, my career have explored different places. You kept uh, staying in New York. What, what do you, why do you think that was? It just worked out that way. I mean, I, I went to school at Cornell college and then I don't want to say made the mistake, but I think <laughs> made a poor choice. I came back to New York with uh, Cornell medical school when I probably would have been better off going to Harvard. Uh, and then I did my training in Boston at the Peter Van Brigham Hospital. Uh, but I also spent time in the Army in Colorado. So I really experienced a lot of different places, but somehow ended up in New York City, where I still am. If we can, one of the topics that we wanted to explore was uh, the part of the book where you talk about your Army experience in Colorado and some of the experiences you had with the uh, CIA operatives. Uh, we found that super, I found that super interesting. Uh, is there something you want to, yeah. Is there something like stories that you want to expand that didn't go in the book? Well, yeah. I mean, I, when I was in the army, of course we had to go in the army and I was lucky enough to go in as a surgeon. Uh, and, and I really got a very good job as a chief of surgery at a hospital in Fort Carson, which was a big base. And unlike most of my colleagues, who were anti-army, I was, I was pretty patriotic. And I volunteered for all sorts of uh, interesting tasks, uh, going out in the field and, and flying on, on missions in helicopters to rescue people in the mountains and stuff like that. But I also volunteered for this CIA mission, uh, which... Uh, dealt with a group of Oriental insurgents that were training in the Colorado mountains at Camp Hale, which is a, a, mount, a mountainous retreat in, in the, as they say, in the mountains in Colorado. And uh, it, it was really interesting because the I got very friendly, friendly with the CIA guys, uh, and some of them were good and some of them were bad. <laughs> And uh, it was super secret. Uh, and of course, they, when, when they were injured at, at the army base where I was, I was the chief of surgery. And there was only one other doctor and one corpsman that got approval to be involved in this mission. Everybody else, it, was, it had to be kept top secret. And uh, these patients would come in either after an injury or with a disease and I and this one other doctor would have to take care of them. Uh, and, and it was, it was exciting. Uh, they would come in with all sorts of injuries. I wasn't well-trained in neurosurgery and there were a lot of head injuries and things like that. 
And uh, invariably, these patients, soldiers, Oriental soldiers, would come in in the middle of the night in a car with shades drawn and so forth, and uh, and I'd have to take care of them. And it was was interesting and exciting. If they came in with big strangulated hemorrhoids, I'd have to give the anesthesia and then operate on the patient because nobody else was cleared for the the secrecy of the mission. And was, I think there was one story I told in the book where this guy came in with these large strangulated hemorrhoids. <laughs> I gave him the spinal anesthesia, took care of the hemorrhoids and sent the, the pathology. I, I thought it could be a malignant tumor as well uh, because it looked like that. So I had to send it to pathology and the CIA guy who was monitoring what I did said, you can't put his name down. You've got to come up with another name. So I put my own name down. <laughs> And everybody was asking me about my hemorrhoids. <laughs> but that was sort of an interesting one. And the, the other really amazing one was this uh, young soldier. They, they were training to do a parachute jumping because that was part of their mission. Uh, and it was to overthrow, I guess, the Chinese Communist government in Tibet. Uh, couldn't talk about it then, but I guess we can talk about it now. And this one guy... He was training for parachute jumping in the uh, frame on which he was practicing these jumps onto the land. The frame came down and he had a, a depressed skull fracture across the front of his forehead with spinal fluid coming out and all the rest. And of course, I wanted, not being neurosurgically trained, uh, I wanted to call the uh uh, in Colorado, there was a big army hospital with a neurosurgeon. I wanted to be able to call this guy. He was a bird colonel uh, who, who I knew, and they wouldn't let me call him. So I had to treat this poor fellow, and I didn't know what I was doing. So I went to the books, and I read and with a uh, open skull fracture, draining spinal fluid. You have to turn a frontal flap. It's a big operation, and I, I was just not equipped to do that. So I sewed up his skin and uh, gave him antibiotics and sat with him for three or four days, and he got better. He was neurologically intact, but he had this very big depressed forehead uh, or depression in his forehead. And uh, I thought that was pretty interesting, too. He, he did well. And when finally I was able to talk to a neurosurgeon, he said, you were just very lucky. <laughs> Moving from those that heal up, regardless how how, how poorly yeah, they, they get treated, to some very sick patients. I was unaware uh, until I read your book of how long, like how how much of your career you focused on on lung transplantation. But what a question that I get as I'm reading the book. Uh, you elaborate beautifully about this whole research and the animals and all this energy you put into the career. And then obviously it's hard in a book sometimes to express everything. But then as you pass the, the, the pages from one chapter to the other, you you very quickly summarize and say, and then I had to pass a page and, and went into this vascular surgery career. And obviously we know now that you were phenomenal at that too. But was there was there a tipping point? Was there a big problem? Was there a, a, a fork in the road that made you change what seemed to be a phenomenal career path in lung transplantation? I mean, you could have done that all your life. And you just decided yeah, to reinvent yourself overnight. Well, I mean, I was board certified in thoracic surgery, which is a whole other story, because I really never was well trained in it, except during my general surgery residency. But uh the reason I got into lung transplantation, I trained at the Brigham, you know, Joe Murray and um, others who ultimately got the Nobel Prize for kidney transplantation. Uh, lung transplant was sort of the poor sister of transplantation. Starzl was doing livers, Shumway was doing hearts, uh, and of course, many people were doing kidneys. But lung seemed to be an obstacle. And so I did that or got into that because. It was a challenge, and and we actually did a lot of uh, animal and other research 
in lung transplantation and did some of the very first lung transplants because we were able to show that what everybody thought was uh, inevitable high vascular resistance in a denervated lung, a transplanted lung, really was due to a relative stenosis at the pulmonary artery anastomosis. Simple as that. Huh. If you make the anastomosis distensible as the flow from uh, all the blood flow from the cardiac output would have to go through that one pulmonary artery, the pulmonary artery would expand dramatically and uh, and the pulmonary artery anastomosis became the site of resistance uh, as the artery expanded. So we showed that the resistance was at that anastomotic site and not in the lung. And that facilitated uh, a single lung transplantation. We did a bunch of hopelessly sick patients with lung transplants. And we actually had one patient that survived for six months and was dramatically palliated, uh, which was the first really successful or partly successful lung transplant. But in New York City, it was impossible to get donor lungs. Why? Again, this gets at the sort of the malign nature of man because the other transplant units that were doing hearts, for example, it was one, uh, we would share the hearts of our cadaver donors with them, but they would not share their lungs with us. And, and it was very difficult to, to procure a donor lung. So the idea of being successful clinically, which we thought we could ultimately do, uh, and is now being done routinely uh, everywhere, uh, it just wasn't a good clinical occupation. And all the while I was doing vascular surgery and I just, and we had a big program project and lung transplant, you know, got millions of dollars of support from NIH and all aspects of it. We really resolved the problems that, that had prevented it from being successful. We really couldn't do it clinically because of the donor problem. And I felt that I wanted to do surgery that was clinical. And that was why we, I left lung transplantation after several years at it and, and went into vascular surgery with the same idea of, of doing things that were either difficult or deemed impossible and, and trying to make them work. Where, where do you think the, the, these solutions for these very complicated problems that you've kind of searched for, it seems like, based on the book, your entire career, um, where does the inspiration for the solution come from? Do, do you have an idea? Is it just... Well, it, it, there's a lot of luck involved for, for one thing. And, and I, I was very lucky because I, I was in a hospital, Montefiore Hospital, which was really, I used to call it a third world hospital. It, it wasn't third world, it was only second world. It was in the Bronx. It was poor. We had very indigent patients mostly minority and, and uh, uh, not there was not a lot of philanthrop philanthropic money given to the hospital. Whereas in Manhattan, we had all these esteemed organizations. We had Cornell, we had Columbia, we had NYU, we had Mount Sinai, really uh, towering hospitals. I was in the Bronx and vascular surgery at the time dealt mostly with aneurysm surgery, carotid surgery, and, and major aortic surgery. And in the Bronx, we didn't get many of those patients referred. And we were lucky, I was lucky, that we had an abundance of poor people with gangrenous toes or feet, uh, ischemic problems. And, and the thinking of the day, really the widespread common knowledge was vascular surgery was not doable to fix these patients' problems because you, you could do an aortofemoral bypass. That was standard practice. But most of the patients had disease below the inguinal ligament, frequently below the knee. And, and the standard treatment of the day, current wisdom was those patients needed a, quote, rapid below knee amputation and then rehabilitation, which didn't usually work in old sick patients. They didn't ambulate with a 
prosthesis very well, unlike a young person who loses their leg. So we had these abundant patients and we sort of by happenstance decided to challenge the thinking of the day and, and tried to operate to do bypasses and other procedures in the lower extremity to save these limbs. And much to my surprise and delight, we found these procedures, if you did them carefully, they usually worked. And uh, so we started the whole uh, current trend to save gangrenous limbs or critical limb ischemia, which you and Miguel have become expert with. And, and I guess I was lucky because we had these abundant patients. I didn't have anybody breathing down my neck and my superiors, et cetera, saying, you can't do this, you can't do that. So we were able to do what we were trying to do. It worked. Nobody believed us when we presented the cases, but we became ever more uh, adept at finding ways to save these limbs. And again, I was lucky because unlike other institutions, we had incredible angiography. Uh, other institutions, they did a lower extremity angiogram. It ended just below the knee in the mid leg. We did angiograms where we visualized the circulation from the renals to the toes. And we saw that most of these patients didn't have a reconstructable artery on the angiogram that ended just below the knee. But if you look at the lower leg and foot, they had patent arteries, which could be used for a bypass. And, and so we started doing those and remarkably they work. If done carefully, they usually work. And, and we were able to use, still people don't believe me, prosthetic grafts to these little vessels. They often work. And uh, the, uh, we would present these hundreds, thousands of cases at very various major meetings, even the American surgical uh, prestigious meetings like that. Nobody would believe us at, at first. And then as time went by, other people were able to reproduce what we were doing. And then endo came along uh, in the 80s. And we were, because our patients were usually sick and old and often very fat, we started out uh, embracing endovascular techniques or having our radiologists perform the endovascular techniques uh, if they had iliac or aortic disease rather than doing a big operation uh, transabdominally. And then we would fix whatever was obstructed below the ingle ligament and would save the patient's legs. So we were early advocates of endovascular. Uh, we wouldn't do the endovascular procedures in those days. Our radiologists would do it with me sitting in the room worrying about the patient when something would go wrong with with the angioplasty. Uh, and then we were lucky also with getting involved with Parodi and doing early EVARs. Uh, again, nobody believed what we were able to do with the uh, endovascular grafts that we were able to make. Uh, following on Perotti's lead. And uh, again, when we would present this at our various national and local uh, regional meetings, people thought we were crazy. They, they didn't believe us. Vascular surgeons, my friends, <laughs> because I was a young middle range leader in vascular surgery. And we present to this group of people uh, some of the endovascular graft work that we were doing, and, and they would laugh at us. They, they, they thought we were out of our minds. Do you remember, sir, when, when the first, first, first time that you ever heard or came across the endovascular procedures, and what was your organic, your visceral reaction to that first time well, that you got to hear about this? Yeah, it's, it's in the book because, I again, I was a young but recognized uh, a fairly prominent guy in, in vascular surgery. I was president of the New York Cardiovascular. I was probably in my 40s. Uh, and I invited daughter to New York. Charlie. You know, from the West Coast. Yep. Charlie Dunn, crazy Charlie. <laughs> and I invited him to our meeting as the guest speaker. 
and he presented this work, you know, with the footprints in the snow. I'm sure you've seen it. Yep. That angioplasty is like a footprint in the snow. You crush the plaque and it becomes like a footprint. Like, that's not how it works at all. But <laughs> he presented this work and nobody in the audience believed him. They were all surgeons, all of them, vascular surgeons. Nobody believed him, but I had the inkling that, you know, maybe he had something. So I paid for my radiologist, the guy named Seymour Sprayreagan, to go out and spend a week with Charlie Goddard and learn how to do what he does. And Spray came back and he said, he's crazy, but let's try to do it. And we started doing iliac and SFA angioplasties, uh, first with the uh, daughter catheter, the tapered catheter, and then with, with dilators, along with the balloon, with the balloon, then we use stents. And again, we present these cases that are vascular surgery meetings, and they thought we were traitors. You know, why, why were we giving these great cases? They ought to come with bypass. Why were we giving them to our radiologists to do endo procedures on? I said, well, they work. And, <laughs> they the patients. and, and nobody believed us. And that was in the, I guess, in the 80s. Uh, and so I was always an endo enthusiast, even though I didn't even know what a sheath was. I, I didn't know what a guide wire was. Uh, I'd done a lot of angiograms as a resident, but we did it with a needle. And it was before the the, uh, the technique came along where you had a guide wire and you, and, and, um, you, you could do anything. Uh, putting in sheaths and guide wires and stuff like that. I didn't know any of that when we teamed up with Perotti to do the first EVAR, but we very quickly learned what they were and and uh, um, and we, we worked very well with our radiologists and, and we didn't work well with our general surgeons. And I, I wanted to start, I happened to be chairman of surgery at the time, I wanted to start a separate department of vascular disease treatment with our radiologists. And I, I was the chair of surgery, so I could represent surgery doing it in our institution, but the head of radiology wouldn't 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 do it. So we then decided that we had to start doing it ourselves as surgeons. And and we learned, uh, made a lot of mistakes, but we learned uh, about guide wire sheaths and uh, balloons and so forth. We have tomorrow, we actually, uh, interestingly enough, we have Juan Barodi coming on the podcast tomorrow, and we're going to be talking a little bit about what he did. But can you walk me a little bit uh, uh, with that story? Juan's a very interesting character. How was that approach when you reached oh, out and how that worked out? Great story. It was a great story. <laughs> Mike Marin, who's now the chair of surgery at Mount Sinai, he's a the grand exalted mystic ruler of surgery in New York City because they they have a lot of hospitals at Mount Sinai and he's he's the head of all that. So Mike was I think a month out of his fellowship and uh, he was covering for me on a weekend and a patient was referred to me with a big painful aneurysm and uh, Mike called me up and, and this guy was totally inoperable. He had bad heart, bad lungs. He was a mess systemically, but he had a big aneurysm. And we knew we couldn't treat him. He, he was not, couldn't undergo general anesthesia. So, and, and we had talked about Perotti's article in our, uh, in, in our research meetings. And so we were very aware of what Perotti was doing. And Mike said, maybe we should consider doing this Perotti procedure on the telephone. I said, absolutely. <laughs> uh, let's go down to Argentina and learn how to do the procedure. And bring it back and do this guy, and uh, so we agreed instantly. I didn't. I didn't. I'm regarded by my wife as being very impetuous. <laughs> I, I didn't think for a second. I when I heard about this patient, that's what we should do. And so I called Perotti, and he knew of me and our meeting. So I said, Doctor Perotti. Maybe you'd like to uh, let us come to Argentina and, and learn how to do this technique of yours and bring it back and do it in the United States. He says, I'm not doing any more cases. And, and so I said, well, why don't you come to New York and help us do this? You can come speak at our meeting and, and we'll do the case together. 
Um, and he, he, he was very resistant. I, I sent him the x-rays from this patient. The patient was an ideal candidate for endo. It was an apple on the string. Um, nice neck, big iliacs, no, and a big symptomatic aneurysm. And uh, so uh, I sent him the x-ray. I guess they got lost in transit. And <laughs> I sent him another bunch of x-rays. It was not, didn't go well. And ultimately, he said he's coming to uh, a meeting of Jerry Doros in, in uh, um, Minneapolis or, or somewhere, Milwaukee. Why don't you come, bring the x-rays, and we'll talk about it. I couldn't go. I had some crisis with our hospital president who's trying to fire me or something. Like that. <laughs> I said, I let Marin go with the x-rays. And Marin hit it off with Juan. And, um, so Juan, ultimately, with great we, we had to, to get him first class tickets, put him up in the Plaza Hotel, him and Sean Holtz and uh, the guy who made the graphs. I've forgotten his name now. Uh, and and uh, I mean, there were all sorts of impediments. And everything, we solved everything except when we tried to get J&J to let us use the palm as stent, which was necessary for the Perotti type graph. Yeah. It wouldn't let us use it. So Marin and I went to, we met with the president. I knew some guy at J&J who knew the president, Marv Woodall, was the president of J&J Intervention, now known as Cordis, I guess. Um, we met them in the uh, Newark airport at the Newark Marriott for dinner. And uh, we put this guy, I've forgotten his name now, my friend, and, and uh, Marv Woodall in the corner, but they couldn't get out. So we were sitting on the edge of the table and they kept saying, no, no, no. And they wouldn't let us, they wouldn't agree and we wouldn't let them out of, out of the restaurant. They wanted to go and finally Woodall, all the, uh, the restaurant was empty, the chairs were on the table, but they were closing. And finally Marv Woodall says, I don't give a damn. He used some profanity. You can do whatever the hell you want. Just let me out. <laughs> we got got to use the large palm as stent. J and J was worried because the uh, they were just starting to do coronary stents with the palm as shat stent, and they didn't. They were afraid they'd lose FDA clearance if they let us do this other case. So we got the okay from J and J, and then Perotti comes. He talks at our meeting, and. Uh, he and Shonos come to our OR, which I have to tell you, Montefiore was worse than third world. We, we'd stolen, not stolen, we had taken a, uh, a fluoro, a digital fluoroscope that the cardiologists were throwing out of their dog lab. <laughs> it was in the garbage. And we took that, Mike and I, and we took it to the OR. That was our fluoroscope. <laughs> And so Brody comes to New York expecting to see this wonderful institution and he sees how primitive we were and he says he looks at the fluoroscope, he looks at our OR table which was worse than primitive he says we can't do the case we're going back to Argentina <laughs> so we and Shonos of course agreed so we uh we said we can't, you know, showed him the patient. You got we got to do this case anyhow. After all this adversity and you know, overcoming it, he finally agreed. We wouldn't let him go without doing the case, and the case went unbelievably well. And the, the patient's pain was gone. He was sitting up the next day in the recovery room reading Playboy <laughs> <laughs> and eating breakfast. His aneurysm, I guess, was cured. Uh, and, and so that was our first case. And uh, so Marin and I decided that we would embark on this endovascular graft program. And we did. Uh, I think we did two or three more cases with Perotti. We brought him back. Fortunately, I had a grant that let me pay for all this airfare that, that he uh, saddled us with. <laughs> we brought him back. We did three other cases. One did pretty well. 
One was a disaster. The graph came down and, and it was a patient with, with uh, uh, portal hypertension. We operated right. on the patient and mm. the patient kept bleeding. It was, it was a disaster. Uh, we, we did an open operation. The other one was partially successful. But the first patient was, well, again, luck, was very successful. And uh, we started to do these cases that had inclusive disease, aneurysmal disease, trauma. And unbelievably, we made the graphs, we made the sheets and put the graphs in the sheets and all the rest and, and tapered tips to the, to the sheets, which we made with a balloon. Um, we, we put these graphs in anybody that we couldn't operate on. We, we didn't do anybody that was operable, and, um, except maybe some trauma cases, I guess. And unbelievably, these cases, 90% of them worked. Um, we were able to get the graphs in position and fix either the occlusion or the, um, or the whatever the lesion was, but it was a, a gunshot or a knife wound. We had lots of knife wounds in those days and, and a fair number of gunshots in the Bronx. We don't have that much anymore. Now they shoot to kill. Um, and and uh, these procedures worked. And so we had probably a hundred cases and, and I was lucky enough to be um, president of the Eastern Vascular and then the SBS. And I gave my talks on these, on these endovascular graphs. And, and again, nobody believed us. They thought we were lying. Uh, and and uh, gradually a few younger people tried it and were able to do the same thing we were. Uh, and, and they worked. And then, of course, industry came along and started making endographs, which were much better than the ones we made. I mean, ours were just a, a, a pomace stent sewn into a piece of Gore-Tex or Impro and, and put in a sheath on a balloon and, um, and then deployed. With the, we got a better fluoroscope, ultimately, and uh, C-arm. And so we were able to do these amazing cases. And, and uh, gradually it caught on, but it, it really transformed, I call it the endovascular revolution. And it, it transformed the, the thinking of surgeons that they had to be involved in this or they were gonna become extinct. And, and that was, I gave that as my uh, SBS presidential address on Darwin. And, and um, it, it turned out there were three things I, I said we should do. First, we should become endovascular competent. We couldn't turn all of these cases over to radiology or cardiology. Second, um, we, we should have our own board. We should be a separate specialty because we're very different. And we were always tortured by the chairman of surgery, just like people still are being tortured by the chairs of surgery or cardiac surgery. So we needed to be a separate specialty with our own board. And thirdly, I said that we should work in institutes or departments of vascular disease treatment where we work with cardiologists and radiologists because we could teach them about the disease and bail them out when we got in trouble. And they could teach us endovascular technology and, and how to use catheters, guide wires, and sheaths. And uh, so the second and third thing never worked. The, the idea of a combined department, that, that didn't work because, again, human nature wouldn't allow it to work. One person wanted all the money or they wanted to be the leader. I proposed sharing leadership, sharing patients, sharing rewards, but that didn't work. And the other one was the independent board, and that's been a total failure. Uh, but becoming endocompetent, I mean, you guys are, are the classic examples of why that's important. You learned how to do what the cardiologist can do and then improved on that. So on that, I was correct. But on the other two, I, I was wrong. Can you can you dive deeper into that kind of struggle for the separate board? Because that for me, that was a very uh, you intriguing. I almost talked my marriage because <laughs> I, I would work on it constantly for years well it costs you a and, job right it costs you friendships and jobs fired because of it yeah that's true but the the uh, 
uh, terminated. I wasn't fired. I was exterminated. Uh, <laughs> and I, I gave the Darwin address, which said we should be a separate board. And Jim Stanley was the next SBS president. And he actually, he bought the things that we were talking about. And he and another guy um, from Atlanta, can't remember his name right now, they formed the American Board of Vascular Surgery. Uh, and I was the, I guess the uh, vice chair and Jim was the chair of that board for many years. And, and we wrote the application to the ABMS. I wrote it with a lot of help from other people. And uh, we applied using the rules of the ABMS, the American Board of Medical Specialists. I, I wrote the application where we fulfilled all the requirements by their bylaws to be an independent new board. And they told us we could never get it because the American Board of Surgery opposed it. And unfortunately, we had unanimity within the specialty and we were working very hard. We wrote newsletters. I usually wrote the newsletter explaining why we needed to have a separate board, why we would thrive with that more than working as a subspecialty of general surgery and um, how wrong it was for general surgeons to be qualified to do what we did. So there were two classes of vascular surgeons, those that were trained and competent and those that were less competent, the general surgeons, most of them. And, and so some of them were quite competent and they would have been, they would have been able to get the board approval according to our application. Uh, so anyhow, we had this nice application, we submitted it and I had friends on the ABMS. I developed friendship with these guys and they told me you're never going to get it. Well, we didn't. The application was, was excellent, uh, but it was disapproved. They never told us why it was disapproved or anything else. So we went, then we appealed the rejection and or the denial, they called it. And the appeal was turned down, was rejected. Why? Because there were a bunch of vascular surgeons who were working for the ABS and were rewarded for doing so. And they basically destroyed our application. Um, and and uh, the, I guess the reason I was uh, exterminated or terminated was that I got a great article in the Wall Street Journal uh, by um, Tom, uh, I, again, I can't remember his last name right now, come to me in a second, a great article on, on why we should have a separate board. And, and we, we had found a patient who'd been operated on by a general surgeon and, and inadequately cared for, ultimately died on the table um, because the general surgeon had said this aneurysm was an easy piece of cake and it really wasn't. It was a difficult aneurysm. He got into bleeding. Patient was ultimately transferred to another hospital where a vascular surgeon stopped the bleeding, but the patient died. That was in Tom Burton was the author in the Wall Street Journal. And, and he wrote this article saying why vascular surgery should be a separate specialty. And um, he got me to talk and, and I, I had said that the American Board of Medical Specialties was an old boys club that cares only about its own vested self-interest and doesn't give a damn about patient well-being. And he quoted me in the article. I'd said it, but I said, you can't quote me. And of course, there it was. He quoted me by name. And um, that ultimately led to my uh, dismissal from, from Montefiore uh, or termination, I guess. And, and the, the, um, the fact was that we lost the battle in part because of the cartel-like nature of the American Board of Medical Specialties, whose purpose, their own stated purpose is to improve care by medical specialization. They don't do that. Uh, they may do it a little, but they, that's not how they function. And uh, so they, they were hostile to us. Ultimately, they got control. The, the uh, surgeons who were, master surgeons who were against independence got control of the SBS. And, and uh, the effort still goes on, uh, but it's, it's not going anywhere 
in every other country, vascular surgery is a separate specialty, but not in the United States. They say we're a separate specialty. We're a separate specialty only as we're still subordinate. How, how would you think that it would add to the practice to us as, as vascular surgeons to have our own? The, the, in the old days, when we were applying in the late 90s and early 2000s, it was because the American Board of Surgery kept the number of vascular surgeons small so that general surgeons who were deemed qualified in vascular surgery could fill the gap. Mm. And we had to then, in those days, train every general surgeon to be a vascular surgeon, even though some of them never would would be. So those were the, that was the problem in the beginning, plus the quality of care delivered by the general surgeons in general, wasn't as good as by vascular surgeons. Today, that that problem doesn't exist anymore because general surgeons are not doing it much, if at all. The problem today is we don't have a seat at the table where resources are given out. We have to go through our, our general surgery bosses and their representation of our interests aren't as good as our representation of those interests might be. So we're, we're still a subordinate, subservient specialty. And I think that limits the number of trainees we can have. Uh, it makes makes life as a vascular surgeon. And, and I and Jim Stanley wrote an article, and I think it was in 2021 or 2020, on the clouded identity of vascular surgery. Nobody knows what we do. If you go to a cocktail party and they you meet some lay person, they say, well, what do you do? I say, I'm a vascular surgeon. Oh, you take care of Erico's veins. Correct. That's not what we do. We do do that, but that's a very minor part of what we do. And it's certainly not the exciting part. What you guys do, what Gustavo Oderreich is doing, um, you know, with fenestrated and branch grafts, that's... That's the exciting part of vascular surgery, ruptured aneurysms. See, do you think there is a, I, I can certainly tell you there's a, a will and there's a lot of us, and I'll openly include myself on that, that would love to see that independence happen. The problem is the SBS. And, and if we got, we lost the SBS, so the American Board of Vascular Surgery, which hasn't done much for the last eight or 10 years, partly I think it's their fault because they haven't acquainted the, the membership, uh, the rank and file vascular surgeon with the issues. It's not talked about anymore. It's deemed a, a bad subject to talk about, which to me is, is wrong. So the ABVS, the American Board of Vascular Surgery, hasn't, in my opinion, done its job in acquainting and, and raising uh, interest in being an independent, especially with the membership of the SBS. But the leadership of the SBS has been very divided as to whether they should pursue independence or not. And it, that, again, gets at the malign nature of man. The individuals who oppose uh, our independence in some way feel rewarded selfishly for not pursuing it. That's the only explanation I can give. There is no reason on God's green earth why we shouldn't be an independent, especially. We qualify in every way, but we need the SBS leadership to go after it again. When Jim Stanley and I and Bob Hobson and Ramon Berger were presidents of the various organizations, the national organization. We had unanimity with all societies, councils of the societies, and membership that we have written articles about. It. Uh, but once we lost control of the SBS, which went back to, I guess, Craig Kent's day and John Towns' day, uh, we, we lost the unanimity, and we who were promoting independence were deemed to be bad guys. 
we're troublemakers, revolutionaries. And that, that isn't true. Our, our main thrust was to make patient care better and make our specialty better. But justice and right is not always triumph. So I, I'm not sure where it's going. I mean, uh, Miguel, you have relationship with our current SDS president, I think you ought to tell him to get on the stick and, and, uh, <laughs> and go after this. And oh. if, if we had three or four successive SBS presidents who pursued it, we'd get it. I bet you we could. I'll make sure that I bring it up to Joe the next time that I, that I see him. Well, he'll say you he must have had a conversation with Veep or Ash, because <laughs> we're, we're trying to talk to him about it, too. The, the, uh, for many years, we had financial support from the SBS for the American Board of Vascular Surgery. And, and under Craig Kent, when he was president of the SBS, he cut that off. And, and that was the end of our, our fight. There are lots of stories that I could tell about it, but we came close, but we didn't quite make it. The last part of your book focuses on the Beast Symposium and all the energy that you've put throughout the years in, in this event. Um, November 2023, I believe, November 14th to the 18th, the Vascular World is coming together on its 50th anniversary. And... I think that has to be a pretty incredible feeling to get 50 years consecutive of probably the number one vascular meeting in the world. Well, we, we'd like to think we're one of the better, uh, more important vascular meetings. But again, luck was a large part of it. Uh, it started out, actually, Henry Hamavici started the meeting um, 50 years ago. And... <clears throat> It was a very small meeting. It was it was held in a flea bag hotel, the Roosevelt Hotel in New York City. It had maybe 10 or 12 faculty members and maybe less than 100 attendees. And he ran it for a couple of years. And then uh, when I took over as chief at Montefiore, uh, I continued it and I was very lucky. Uh, first of all, the meeting was in New York, which is easy to get to. Secondly, I was lucky in that I realized the importance of partnering with industry, that industry previously was looked on by vascular surgery leaders as being second rate um, sacrifice or hangers on. I started to recognize, I guess because of my endo affiliation, that industry was as important as we surgeons in creating advances in in what we do um, and that they should be treated as partners, not as uh, money sources to be harvested. Um, I mean, John Manick was very uh, negative about industry support. I was very positive about industry support and I felt that they were very deserving of our respect and partnership. And so that was a second area that, that we were very fortunate in, in getting on to. And then because I wanted to have lots of speakers, I realized they couldn't all talk for 10 or 15 minutes. So we came up with the idea of the very short talk. And that, again, was luck largely because that enabled us to get many more speakers on the program to get different points of view, uh, sometimes antagonistic points of view on issues. Uh, and, and that, the, the additional thing which was in New York City, which was very easy to get to from foreign countries, as well as everywhere in, in, in the States and, and everywhere in the world. So those four things enabled us to, to grow the meeting into a much larger meeting than it is today. And hopefully it will continue for another 50 years uh, under renewed leadership and so forth. But it's a crazy world. We're living in a, as, as you know, from watching the news, we're living in a crazy world. And uh, um, 
I, you know, the, the future is quite uncertain. Money is tight. Uh, industry is having a hard time. Doctors are having a hard time. Doctors are, are largely in, in big institutions are indentured servants. Correct. They're, they're, mm. You know, they're salaried employees. And, and that makes makes it very difficult. Do you think that stifles innovation, the the hospital employed model? I, I, I do. Again, it's up to the individual. I was hospital employed. It's, that, that alone is not a problem. The problem is that doctors are not respected. I, I mean, it's, it's largely felt that doctors are replaceable. If one guy goes or is fired, you just, you bring in another doctor. I mean, that's like having a baseball team where you have interchangeable players. It doesn't work that way. There are exceptional players in baseball and football, and there are exceptional players in vascular surgery or in any area of medicine. And I think they'll be exceptional in any system. They want to do interesting things. They didn't want to do what's different and better. And I think even in, a, in, in some of the um, restricted space that we're now functioning in, where you have to, all that matters to the administrators is the RBUs and the DRGs. All they care about is money. And, and so you don't get credit for the papers you write. You don't get credit for the, uh, the breakthroughs that you have. You don't get credit for the good care that you give. And that, of course, leads to the uh, issue that we saw written up in the New York Times and elsewhere about patients being treated. And I, I appreciate your views on this. The, the article in the New York Times about what was going on in, in uh, Michigan, where uh, these patients were being treated with atherectomy many, many times and ultimately losing their leg. And the implication was that they, all they had was an asymptomatic lesion or uh, m minimal claudication. But what, what's your view about that? I think incentives, I think human beings, beings operate on incentives. So if you... No question about it. If you place a system where the incentives are not aligned with your outcomes, then you're going to not have that outcome. So if, you're, if your incentives are, you know, you, you get a certain revenue uh, from a procedure that, uh, you know, it takes you two hours to do and you have a pretty picture at the end and you can justify it based on just that picture that really may not have any physiologic relevance, uh, <clears throat> then you're going to have those outcomes uh, and then, you, you know, you put human nature in it and, and that is so I think we need to align incentives with outcomes. Um, well, you know, it, it, yeah, I think you're, you're right about that. I think we, we've also lost our ethical compass. Physicians and surgeons have lost their ethical compass to some extent because you can get good outcomes if you operate on patients that don't need it yeah. universally. And yeah. what's, I, I, I remember talking to the ladies that wrote that article. Uh, I actually got Joe Mills an interview with them so they could talk about it. And, and I brought up the point of what, what just happened today, I read about it or yesterday, that CMS has approved carotid stenting for asymptomatic carotid disease. I think CMS is at fault. Now, I, I believe they responded to political pressure from the cardiologists and they approved this. This is going to lead to a feeding frenzy of unnecessary procedures, yeah. which may not help patients, but worse, still may harm more patients than they help. And, and so I think the really bad guy in this, in that whole system that that article exposed is CMS. They should never approve, have approved atherectomy for widespread general use and, and rewarded it with big uh, compensation. And, and they shouldn't have approved carotid stenting for asymptomatic carotid stenosis. I don't know what your view is. I think Carotid stenting probably has a role, but it shouldn't be done for asymptomatic disease. I'm personally a little bit more concerned with how politically ignorant we have been to maneuver this particular situation 
and allowing the discussion of this topic to be somewhat sensationalized in the media. And I believe that that's very dangerous. I think we should have competent scientific conversations that lead to decision-making policy or policy that's based on science and facts. But we shouldn't run to the media and, ex and, and try to create these exposés that sometimes have two or three or four sides to the same story. I, 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 I couldn't agree more with you. And, and when I read the article, when we were doing our original limb sandwich work, we would take patients that were turned down or badly treated at other institutions, and we would try to save their legs. And sometimes we fail. Correct. We didn't succeed every time. So if the guy in Michigan was uh, doing patients for critical limb ischemia, and, and he lost some legs, that's, that's part of the game. But the implication was that he was doing cases that were minimally symptomatic. And if that's the case, that article was probably on target. But I agree with you, that article hurt all of us. It, yeah, we're, we're, we're now facing a wave of denials on CLTI care, especially from Medicare Advantage. So federally funded, but privately managed. They're allowing us to do only diagnostics on CLTI patients. And then they want us to come back with a diagnostic angio a week or two or three later to get the approval or run the risk of doing the procedure, finishing, doing what's, doing what's right for the patient, and then having to go back to them to plea the case so that we get paid back for the case. Yeah. Well, <laughs> so, but again, that's incentives. No, that, that, that is just that, again, people make these decisions and they make the so That's going to incentivize patients not being treated and patients losing their legs. I think some, one of the very simple things that we should do is, you know, um, compensate, uh, drive the comp compensation uh, to parity because for me, I mean, I'm, I'm probably not the best, you know, bypass surgeon in the world, but it takes me like four hours to do a, a greater saphenous vein bypass, which, you know, when you have a complex lesion, multiple level lesion, sh probably may, and you have a, a patient that is demo for open surgery, that's probably the right surgery for the patient, especially with a large wound. Right. But, you know, you can do the, you can get, flow you can get perfusion to that limb in two hours uh, doing a, a endovascular procedure so there is a misalignment in incentives because when you it's not just about money it's also that you have you know three other cases that you need to do there's also that you have your clinic that you need to attend to and and all these things compound to uh, maybe the best decision not being taken um, so we have to really think about incentivize. So if it takes me, it should be paid per like per time unit. So so I, I, I think we'll we'll have to end up developing centers of excellence that are pre-qualified with certain things, certain classifications, certain mechanisms of of knowing that they're doing the right thing, showing your results and sharing your databases. And at the end of the day, I would remove the fee for service for complex care and would think about value-based programs. Uh, I think that's probably a good solution for the well, future. Miguel, but it, it's another reason to have a separate specialty. Totally. Because I, I think in vascular surgery now, there are many areas of subspecialization. And even though we can do it de facto, we should have certificates of special competence in lower extremity. Correct. In, in complex aneurysms. Correct. Carotid, venous disease. Etc. And and there's a subspecialty uh, category within organized medicine. You can't have recognized subspecialty, and I think that's another reason that we should have our own board. But it doesn't matter. We're not going to get it. <laughs> well, let's hope that yeah. that we do, sir. And I want to be respectful of your time. This has been phenomenal. The conversation has been enriching, enlightening. I'm sure that our listeners are going to love it. I am looking forward to seeing you in New York. I will be there. I think that Lucas will be there, and I know a lot of our listeners will be there. And a call to action to all of you out there thinking still about coming, get your ass in gear. It's a Come to New York. Yeah. It's, well, I'm going to say it's the best meeting that I go to. I enjoy it dearly every year, and I look forward to doing it 
again, you, you, it, you're on your 50th. I think I'm on my 15th. <laughs> that's, that's, that's great. But listen, thanks for the kind words and thanks for chatting with me. It's been my pleasure. Sir, it's been our pleasure too. Thank you very, very much. You have a good night. Thank you.